All right. My last name is Sykes, not Skies, but I appreciate the great intro. Spe you know, spelled the same, more or less. So uh, I work in the same lab as Diana, Sally, and Jerry, who talked earlier. And my research is a little bit of a uh, combination of what the two of them presented. Um, so this is a kind of a picture of my field site, which is Saddle Peak, the same area where Diana is doing her uh, time lapse photography. Some of the research questions that we're looking at are um, how do, does the travel behavior of these side country skiers on Saddle Peak change as we have changing avalanche conditions? So as we have changing hazard level, but also changing avalanche problem. Um, we want to look at these human factors that Jerry talked about. So like the heuristic traps that McCammon studied and see whether or not we can pick out their prevalence by, by surveying backcountry skiers. And then we're also looking at if we put a bulletin at the backcountry boundary informing skiers of what the avalanche hazard is for the day, if that has any influence on their decision making and their travel behavior. So Diana showed this picture earlier. This is uh, 2010 avalanche on Saddle Peak. Uh, you can see the crown line goes all the way across. This is kind of that most common, safest run that she talked about. And uh, this is the general area of the the boundary, the backcountry boundary. So some of these human factors that we're looking at by giving out surveys to our participants are, uh, are people making these kind of slow calculated decisions using things like the avalanche forecast level, um, if they're doing any observations on their own, uh, and the weather forecast, or are people kind of making quick decisions and using these heuristic traps or shortcuts so that they're not necessarily going in a step-by-step -step decision making process but they're more just jumping from the start to the end and kind of making a uh, little bit less objective decision over whether to travel. So again this is our field site on Saddle, uh, kind of the boundary of Saddle Peak. So we just stand up here and hand out GPS units and we did a kind of an experimental design where we just flip a coin and decide whether or not to put this board up. So we have in the center there, we have just the overall hazard level. This is coming from the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center. So the overall hazard level, a little description of the North American danger scale. And then on the right side, uh, we have the kind of more detailed forecast. So this is just pulled straight off of the Avalanche Center website in Bozeman. And it's not necessarily specific to the bridgers. Our forecast changes how they discuss the avalanche problems depending on the conditions. But it's just kind of what's publicly available out on the website. So we ended up doing this about half of the time, putting this board up or not putting it up. And uh, we're going to see if it makes any uh, difference. This is kind of what our, just a example of our daily GPS tracks. We use these little kind of handheld Garmin GPSs. And so on any given day, we have hand them out. A lot, a lot of people will travel up the ridge. So everything beyond this red line, more or less, is backcountry train. And so we stand up there, hand out the GPS, and then the GPS kind of does laps up the lift. And we keep handing it out. Hopefully, the more times, the better. You can see on the bottom here, just showing our elevation change throughout the day, and then the speed uh, based on the distance between the different GPS points. So the GPS track gives us the time that the point and the uh, location, so we can figure out the distance that they traveled in a certain amount of time. Diana talked a little bit about using her, um, her photos to pull out terrain metrics. So this is just a little more uh, of that type of analysis. So up top here you can see our slope analysis and there's, can't really read this legend, but generally green is safe, less than 25 degrees, uh, and then yellow to red is getting steeper and steeper. Those large cliff bands she was talking about are all over in here, which is under a lot of the more popular runs on saddle. The second image shows the uh, slope curvature in a cross slope. So reds are going to show us like the if you're in a gully, like a, a gully going down slope, maybe more of an area where you'd collect debris if you were in an avalanche. And this bottom one is our downslope curvature. So are we, reds is going to be more of a convex roll. So maybe a more likely area to trigger an avalanche. Greens are more concave. 
So those are some of the tools that we're trying to use to evaluate how people are making decisions. So a little bit about our results. We just did, this is just from last year. So we ended up with uh, around 100 tracks when it was all said and done. We had to, a lot of people would do the GPS, but they didn't want to fill out the survey. So we had to get rid of those. So this is everyone we could get to do the whole study. Uh, generally, the days that we went out were either on moderate or considerable avalanche days. We had 85 tracks from days with moderate hazard and 15 from days with considerable. And we had, in terms of avalanche problems, we had loose wind and wet, and that's just the primary problem for the day. So we picked the maximum hazard for the day for the forecast area and the primary avalanche problem to represent the data. Some of the kind of demographics based on our survey. So we have kind of a more experienced and older population than we were thinking, because MSU has got so, such a big college influence on the town. But our mean age is 39 years old. So, uh, and then our mean number of years skiing for our participants is 30. So people have been skiing for a long time and generally uh, older than we thought. Uh, we ended up with 89 guys and nine females. So unfortunately, we're trying to work on that for next year. But uh, yeah, it's all volunteer based. So it's, it's hard for us to tell exactly what the size of the population is because we're just standing up there handing out GPSs, but trying to get as much of a representative sample as we can. So here we're looking at people's self-rated backcountry experience on the upper right. So you can see we have a huge majority of people who are rating themselves as expert level backcountry skiers. And if you look in the bottom right, we actually, the majority of people have never taken a formal avalanche class. <laughs> so a good chunk of people with no avalanche education whatsoever and then kind of dwindling down as we get into higher levels of formal avalanche education. So the self-rated experience versus the actual education doesn't necessarily match up for our group. In terms of how people are traveling, this biggest chunk is uh, just alpine skis. So Saddle Peak, just the way that it's oriented, you don't actually have to skin. You can take the lift, ski down, throw your skis on your shoulder and hike up. So you don't necessarily need specialized backcountry gear to access it. Uh, and then we have 33% backcountry skis and 15% uh, snowboarders. We had zero split borders all year. But it makes sense because you don't need a split board to access the terrain. So. Um, okay, so we're looking here at what kind of equipment do people have. So we can see only 75% of the people who took our survey were carrying a shovel. And 80% were carrying a probe. Uh, in order to ride the lift just to access this area, you have to go through a beacon checker. So we assume that 100% of people have beacons because you need one to get there. But it's kind of alarming that we have 25% of our population that don't have the equipment necessary to rescue their partners that are going out there. And then as far as whether people are doing any kind of their own observations in the field, the largest number here is we have 36% who are doing some kind of traveling test. Very, very low amount of people who are doing snow pitch, which for our area, since we're a little more continental snowpack, I would say the backcountry population tends to do a lot of pit digging, maybe versus more continent or more uh, maritime. So that seems like a pretty low number generally for our area. And then, I don't know if you remember this, but from Diana, she presented that big 2010 avalanche, which was triggered by somebody knocking down a cornice. So the the number of people doing cornice tests and ski cuts is a little alarming considering how many people you can have on slope at any given time. <laughs> okay, so some more graphs. We got a really high number of solo skiers. 35% of our participants were skiing solo. And then a, a large number of groups of two and kind of steep decline after that. On the top here, this is People, we asked them to circle what the forecast level was for the day, and then we compared that against the actual forecast uh, bulletin from the Forest Service. And only 59% were able to accurately tell us what the hazard level was for the day. So we had 40% of our participants that didn't know the avalanche hazard for a given day. Okay, so that's some of the demographics. From there, we're hoping to be able to 
use travel behavior, so based on their GPS track, where people are going, we wanted to pull out, like, okay, if you have high level of education, does that influence the, you know, the slope angle, the curvature, those kind of things for your track? And unfortunately, what we found is, these are just three examples of pretty flat trends. So you can see there's not much difference. These are box plots. Doesn't really matter what they are, but you can just see that across all three of these graphs, it's a pretty flat trend. So we're not able to detect differences between the groups based on their terrain metrics. Uh, and we think that's because the terrain is just too homogenous. It's all same, or more or less same aspect, and it's all pretty steep. So we have like our safest line on Saddle Peak, but the safest line is still well above 35 degrees and that big avalanche crown from 2010 cut right across the middle of it. So even the safest line is all relative. This is our picture. These are all moderate hazard avalanche tracks. So these are 85 moderate tracks. And you can see there's a huge spread in terms of the areas people are skiing. This central line is that, we call it the north shoulder. So that's the, it's a relatively safer line. It kind of sticks out from the ridge. So it's not gonna be as much of a terrain trap. This is another popular area where the other big avalanche Diana showed was. This is the football field. So we get a lot of traffic in here. And uh, one thing that's tempting about this is it's about a 30 second walk out of the boundary. And then you can just make a couple turns and duck back in. Whereas all these other areas take a much more significant amount of effort to access. So those are our moderate hazard tracks. These are our considerable tracks. So obviously there's a lot less of them. We're working on that for next year. But there also seem to be a little bit more clustered, especially around this run here uh, and the football field. So we're going to try, you know, obviously we need more data would help our analysis. So we're going to be back out there this winter and try and get some more data and uh, see what people are doing. So based on the fact that we couldn't separate people's tracks just by looking at the numbers, pulling the train metrics out of the points. What we're now trying to do is we're going to use these run codes and try and characterize the runs and then see which runs people are selecting as opposed to using the statistics from each point of the track. So it's just a different way to approach the analysis where we could maybe characterize the consequences of each run as opposed to the, the just number of slope angle that you skied and try and parse out some differences in that way. And when we do that, just initially, we can see that we do have, this is a measure of curvature based on the run classification, and we see much more difference in the, uh, when we group by run than we do when we just uh, pull out the raw numbers from the total track. So for future, we need more data. We're gonna try and do some uh, analysis that accounts for weather conditions. So is the primary driver of when people are going out avalanche hazard, or is it just days that it snowed? You know, new snow or temperature or all those things. Bridger Bowl, where this research takes place, has a good network of weather stations, so we can pull some of that data. And then we're going to look at doing a spatial analysis uh, for each run using like an eights type scale, which is looks like this. So you're kind of categorizing the run based on simple, challenging, or complex. Uh, it's based on these 11 factors, like slope angle is a big one, um, whether you have multiple paths crossing, and all that kind of stuff. And these, uh, the, this is a map from Yukon, Avalanche Yukon, and they publish them for a lot of pop popular backcountry areas as a decision-making tool. So we're going to try and create one of these for Saddle Peak to tell us a little something about the, the different run groups that we have. Cool, so just in summary, uh, we see a higher level of experience, ski experience, and uh, higher age than we were anticipating on saddle. Um, we got to have a pretty large portion of the, of the participants that don't know the avalanche hazard for the day, which is alarming. And then, you know, we also have this big chunk of participants that don't have the rescue gear they need to actually uh, save their partners in the case of an avalanche. But we also see kind of qualitatively the... Um, we have less tracks on higher hazard days. So, and there was a couple days that we went out and got absolutely no tracks on a considerable day. So it's possible that people, instead of choosing one run over the other to decide what's safer, they may just be choosing to not go. And that's kind of their way to uh, have conservative decision making on elevated avalanche hazard. So, cool, thanks.
yeah, these are all our sponsors that have helped us out with a little bit of funding for the research. And yeah, does anybody have any questions? Does anyone have any questions for John? Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's kind of hard to see with that Snuck light. In on me. Yeah, I, I did. Sorry. Um, I know it's not very scientific, but um, when you get groups of people out there, do y'all have any way to quanti or qualitatively discover if there's peer pressure involved? Like, come on, oh, come on, Joey, let's go do it. Right. Kind of thing. It's stuff we see in the motorcycling world. I know. We can ask it in our surveys. Whether or not people admit to it is, uh, is another question. So we do, we have, I'd say four or five questions in our survey that ask about group dynamics and decision making. And they're more focused on whether other groups are influencing their decision making than like the within group dynamics. Uh, but it seems like people, especially people who have taken avalanche education, they know what the answer is supposed to be. So it's hard to say if they're giving us truthful <laughs> answers. Okay. But we're trying. A question in the back. Um, so once you get more data, how do you see this being applied, or what do you, um, it, how do you envision, envision this, I guess, impacting the backcountry community? So I guess we see this, uh, this lift access backcountry or side country community as a as a population that's maybe targeted for a little more input in their avalanche education. So, uh, whereas a backcountry skier, they have a ton of time on the way up to collect inf information and make their own OBS, and the avalanche education is really hammered at backcountry. Whereas for side country skiers, you can make like a split second decision to go out of bounds or stay in bounds. So, we're just trying to inform the education for side country skiers a little better. Yeah, up front. Did you find that posting the avalanche ha hazard changed people's behavior in any way? Uh, I will let you know once I run those numbers. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, again up front. Um, two questions. The first is, have you thought about using technology that's like smartphone apps, you know, to get so much more data without having to talk to everybody? Yeah, so G the project that Jerry and my advisor Yordi work on, it's volunteer through smartphone, so it's through the ski tracks. And we intentionally wanted to go and just physically hand out GPSs to take away a little bit of the sampling bias so that you don't have to download the app, activate it at the beginning of the day. It's more, all you have to do is say yes, carry it, and do a run. So it's a little, hopefully a little bit broader cross-section of the population. And then you can validate it with the app and see if it shows you a similar or different Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the other one, yeah, question was about bias because, um, you can't force the people to fill out your survey and to take the GPS. So, do you get a? Do you think your sample uh, is biased towards more responsible people who are like? And that would be really scary. Like yeah. If these <laughs> right. I mean, I think that we've seen a pretty good broad range of interest. Uh, people in Bozeman are used to snow science researchers bugging them. Uh, so generally, people seem interested. We do get a lot of repeat users. So if I'm there three days in a week. You know, this person might be psyched the first time, and then the second two times they're like, oh, I've already done this, so I just want to go skiing. So um, I think we're getting a pretty good uh, representative sample for that population, but it's hard to be sure. Do we have a final question for John? Yeah, up here. Are these surveys something they just can fill out on the lift ride back up? Yep, exactly. So yeah, so we designed the survey. You just need a Sharpie and we hand it, you basically get the GPS at the boundary, ski the line, and then it filters you right back to the bottom of the lift, which is, this area is really set up well for it. And then you take the survey on the lift up and drop it in a box. So it's trying to be as little, uh, as least inconvenient as possible, but yeah, sometimes people are still inconvenienced by it. Cool, thanks John. Thanks. We are down to our last presentation of the day. Um,